We're now going to increase the tempo a bit and jump straight into the opening night panel featuring stalwarts from the practice and the industry. I request the chair of the panel, Mr. Ratan K. Singh, senior advocate, to please take the floor. Thank you, Raghav, and thank you, Tejas. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to be back again with this first day's uh, session one, first day's session, evening session, which we all are uh, looking with great enthusiasm. And uh, for that, I must thank all the panelists for agreeing to participate and sparing their precious time for contributing to this panel discussion. Uh, this is Ratan. I'm your moderator for the opening night session on the topic, construction arbitration, diverse perspectives, unified goal. Uh, this session is planned in question answer format. And before I begin the session, may I briefly introduce my esteemed panelists. Uh, first of all, Lord Honorable Mr. Justice A.K. Sikri. Uh, Miller Justice Sikri was appointed as judge of Delhi High Court in the year 1999. Before that, he had a roaring practice on commercial side as well as labor and rich side. Miller Justice Sikri was one of the 50 most influential persons in intellectual property in the world in the survey conducted by Managing Intellectual Property Associations for the year 2007. Miller Justice Sikri was elevated as the Chief Justice of Punjab and Haryana High Court with effect from 23rd of September 2012 and elevated to the Supreme Court of India on 12th of April 2013. After demitting office, Miller Justice Sikri was not spared by the commercial world, world of arbitration, and Miller Justice Sikri was requested to be judge, which request he, Miller Justice Sikri accepted and became judge of Singapore International Commercial Court, which office he holds till today. Apart from that, Miller Justice Sikri sits as arbitrator. And I say this with all confidence, that Milo Justice Sikri is one of those rare, one of those arbitrators, construction arbitrators in India, who not only has neck for the details and technology, but also is aware of the best practices of construction arbitration. He is aware of the best practices of dispute avoidance and dispute resolution. Miller Justice Sikri is thorough with the SCL delay and disruption protocol. In one of my conversations, Miller Justice Sikri said that he had, in fact, referred to the SCL protocol in some of his awards. In fact, I had the privilege of appearing before Miller Justice Sikri as counsel. And no lawyer can get away with just arguing before Miller Justice Sikri that these are the number of days of delay for region A, B, C. Miller Justice Sikri puts his, ask the council appearing before him, tell us the criticality of the delay, was the delay falling on the critical path, whether delays really uh, delayed the completion of the project or not. So I, I'm really thankful to Miller Justice Sikri for sparing time from his BJ schedule. Thank you. Thank you, sir. After that, we have Ms. Jane Davis Evans. Jane is ranked for energy disputes in construction and international arbitration legal 500 and chambers and partners and recognized in who's who legal construction as a thought leader. Ms. Jane Davis Evans is from three Verulium buildings and sits as arbitrator. Though she has been also uh, representing the parties as counsel, but she sits more as arbitrator now. And 
Jane will be giving us in today's session the, 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 the perspective of arbitrators. And my Lord Justice Sikri will be giving us his perspective as a judge. Jane is regularly instructed in relation to significant infrastructure projects, both as counsel in dispute boards and international arbitrations, and provide advices and assists with the drafting and negotiation of project documentation. Jane returned to the bar in 2014, having spent many years working for two of the world's leading arbitration groups, Sermon and Sterling LLP, and mostly recently, Pressfields, Prakhaus, Deringer LLP. Jane is a fellow of Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales, and is particularly skilled in addressing complex financial issues. Jane is also vice co-chair of the IBA International Construction Project Subcommittee, DR Subcommittee, and Jane is also vice chair of the 3VB, International Advisory and Dispute Resolution Awards. Thank you, Jane, for being part of this panel. And we are looking forward to hear you and have your experiences. Uh, we have Julian Bailey, partner of White and Case. Julian Bailey, solicitor and partner of White and Case London. He has been featured in Who's Who Legal Future Leaders 2018 as excellent and key player in Qatar, noted for his impressive intellect as well as his considerable activity in market. He is a visiting fellow at the Diction Pune School of Law, London. He is adjunct professor of law at Hamad bin Khalifa University, Doha. He was chairman of the Society of Construction Law UK for the year 2015-16, and he is the author of Construction Law, third edition 2020 published by London Publishing Partnership. Before I move on to the next speaker, I must say, I'm a big fan of Julian. I'm a big fan of Julian, not because we know each other for long, Julian was kind enough to accept our invitation to be a speaker for the last evening, but also for the simple reason that I have fallen in love with Julian's book. Construction law. Julian, this your book is really teaching and making lots of construction arbitrators all across the globe. Hats off for this great work you have done and great service you have done to the construction industry. Now we have last but not the least, Mr. Rajdeep Sachdeva. Rajdeep Sachdeva was kind enough to accept our invitation for being part of this session to share his experience and thought from the perspective of consumer of arbitration and construction arbitration. Rajbir has 30 years of experience as corporate lawyer. He has extensively worked in domains of merger and acquisition, competition laws, IPR, real estate, real estate, infrastructure, arbitrations in India and abroad, and his experience in IBC. Mr. Sajdeva was previously senior executive director and group general counsel of DLF Limited, one of the real estate magnates in India. Mr. Sajdeva is with us to share his experience, vast experience, I would say, as in-house counsel and as the disputant and as the consumer of arbitration. With this introduction of my esteemed panel, I now commence the session with the first topic of the session, and that is quality of decision making and expectations from the process. And to start the conversation on this topic, interesting topic, may I start with Melo Justice Seekri. So you have served as a judge for many years and continue to be a judge and continue to judge a judge of Singapore International Commerce in Court, judge as the arbitrator 
and decision maker, I would imagine that you have had to review over hundreds of arbitral awards in setting aside or annulment proceedings or enforcement proceedings during this period. What would you say, sir, are the characteristics that separate the quality awards from the mediocre and average ones? Obviously, the context would be construction awards. May I request you to kindly share your thoughts on this, sir? First of all, thank you very much, uh, Ratan Singh, for your generous introduction. I don't know whether I deserve it or not, but uh, my, I profusely thank you for that. And uh, I also am privileged to be in this panel where uh, three other panelists who are uh, experts in their respective fields. Yes, who doesn't know Julian or Jane? I have not met Julian earlier, but yes, I have also known him through his books and it is lying here also with me. <laughs> I keep reading it with interest. And uh, uh, you have said a lot about Jane and Sajdeva also have known him a bit. So I'm in August company. I must uh, uh, in a way thank myself that uh, I've got this opportunity. Uh, you have given me the role in this panel uh, as a, a the perspective of a judge how we have to uh, so that therefore i would be speaking from that angle of course before becoming judge i had the experience as a lawyer also and after demitting office as the supreme court judge i am working as arbitrator as well but yes coming to the question uh, uh, let me uh, tell you, uh, we know now, uh, and it is uh, 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 an acceptable norm, uh, whether it is domestic arbitration or international arbitration, that the arbitrators are supposed to pass reasoned award. We had that regime under our 1940 Act, Arbitration Act, where the awards could be non-speaking. And uh, unless the parties in their arbitration agreement said that it has to be a speaking award. So if when the award has to be a speaking award, so I feel, yes, they are, the arbitrators are still not supposed to, uh, I, I mean, act as judges, the way judges uh, write their judgments. But yes, the basic features which a judgment contains are supposed to be in the uh, uh, award as well, when we talk of quality awards. And what we find and uh, what we want to find in a particular judgment and likewise in the award and more particularly when it comes to construction award that whether the uh, award reflects that the arbitrator or the arbitral tribunal has understood the case of both the parties which is stated therein and which is reflected in the award and what are the areas of differences or disputes whether they are properly demarcated and there is a good um, uh, analysis on facts when the findings uh, are to be arrived at, where the disputed facts are there, and on what basis the legal issues are analyzed. And from the reading of the award, this is what we uh, expect in judgment, the same thing we expect uh, in the award. So from the reading of the award, we are able to find out that uh, the, the award contains all these things. And it is of course, uh, and uh, if I may say so, award of it, if it is challenged, it comes to the court, or it and it's an uh, it is to be enforced, and in that sense, it comes to the court. Courts uh, are seized of uh, that award in one form or the other, but primarily that is meant for the parties uh, because it is the parties who are involved in that dispute, and the uh, award is given, so it should be for the benefit of the parties and they have been able to understand. So it should be therefore very clearly all these aspects have to be stated. Now, having said so, and uh, 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 if I may come to, uh, when we come to the, uh, I mean, uh, construction arbitration, two or three main aspects, uh, that there's some special or peculiar features of the construction arbitration. And uh, 
it is in a way it has become very highly technical because of the complexity of the issues which are involved and uh, it depends upon uh, the kind of so first of all the construction of the project the project which was involved that itself may uh, I, I mean require some kind of expertise and even in the construction it may be uh, depending upon what kind of construction project it was uh, the niceties or the nuances would be there it may be a shipbuilding contract it may be oil rigs uh, construction it may be buildings buildings may be hospital it it may be uh, the theater it may be a hotel uh, it, it it may be construction of a township it may be national highways or state highways as mr gadkari was talking about so therefore the nuances in all these kinds of different kinds of uh, 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 projects which are there would be different so whether the arbitrator the award reflects that the arbitrator has been able to understand the niceties of uh, that particular construction and is able to deal with that and what i have found if i may say so in particular that there are two and one one you have yourself uh, spoken uh, the, the two or three aspects which always come because we have seen in the construction and and that is the main reason which leads to the uh, litigation also we have seen that in most of the construction projects the projects the time which is there in the contract which is always we start with and the provision in the contract is the time is the essence of the contract but in more than 90% of the projects at least that is my experience in india and it may be elsewhere also the times are overrun time limits so therefore delays take place so once the delay takes place the mostly the uh, i mean the claims would be uh, escalation cost loss of profit on that basis on compensation for delays etc varied kinds of claims around surrounding that so what becomes important is that delay took place for what reason and how so there may be some reasons because of which of which are attributable to the employer because there are uh, obligations and reciprocal obligations in every such contract which are to be performed by both the sides so whether some of the uh, 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 i mean uh, the obligation which were to be performed by uh, the uh, the employer like giving of site uh, the drawings etc uh, good for construction drawings and various uh, other uh, 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 this uh, 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 various other instructions which are to be given from time to time and on the other hand there are obligations on the part of the contractor as well so but then in the delay uh, delay may be attributed to both but what are those critical delays which have led to which uh, the point you pointed out i have seen and if i may say so now from my experience and that is where the uh, the, the, the quality of award gets separated from mediocre award many times this delay analysis is not undertaken in the fashion it should be taken and uh, therefore on that basis uh, because from delay and how much is the critical delay attributed to whom got second aspect would be uh, determined thereafter that is of the compensation etc all those kinds of uh, compensations which are and the quantification thereof that question would arise so in so far as this is concerned the delay analysis many times i have seen in the awards it is not there i have seen in many times that if some of the fault may lie uh, and i am talking in the in context of uh, uh, domestic arbitration that uh, uh, experts delay experts have not produced so therefore it is only on the basis of uh, the documents some uh, uh, um, submissions are made by both the parties and uh, uh, so critical delay analysis is not taken up and the sec so therefore that is one where it may make a difference between a good a quality award from uh, uh, a mediocre one and the second aspect which uh, follows from this is about the uh, uh, quantum of uh, this compensation we know that uh, uh, as you have mentioned about the scl uh, uh, document scl protocol and it mentions about various kinds of uh, um, this uh, delay uh, uh, deceptions methodologies nobody most of us have not uh, or in india have seen that they don't know which is to be applied at what stage neither the lawyers are helping nor the 
uh, arbitrator is pointing out. Same thing applies, I have seen, when we come to the quantification of these damages. We know that, uh, and it is in the judgments also, it has been mentioned, we know about McDermott judgment or uh, the uh, uh, Kailashnath associate judgment, that Hudson formula, Emden formula, or Ashley formula, which are mentioned therein. But which formula to be applied under what circumstances and which would be apt? Many times there's not much uh, a discussion or a quality discussion on that. So therefore, I would say the, these are some of the aspects which would, uh, uh, I mean, uh, separate a quality award from a mediocre award. At the end, I may say this as a judicial review, when you're sitting as judge, you are not sitting as the appellate authority. You can't interfere with the award merely because you think that the award is wrong. Yeah, it's, it's a, a judicial review is very, very limited. But at the same time, that task of a judge may become very easy if all these aspects are taken care of by the arbitral tribunal in the award. So that is what I would like to uh, that would be my answer to your question. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much uh, for giving a brief idea about what distinguishes the quality awards with the mediocre and average award. Now, moving over to Jane, who will bring us the arbitrator's perspective. To my Lord Justice Seagree's comments. Uh, what can, an, Jane, my question to you is, what can an arbitrator do to ensure that the award is as accurate as can be? And what, you, what are your expectations from councils in contributing to this? And after you are done with the answer to this question, I have another question which is a follow-up question from Miller Justice Seekri's statement that in most of the cases in India, unlike other jurisdictions, parties do not cite experts, particularly delay experts. So we would also like to know from you how you as an arbitrator would decide a delay dispute brought before you in an arbitration without there being any assistance of the report of a delay analyst. So for you, you have two sets of questions. You can start with your the first and then follow up with the next. Thank you, Ratan. And if I can second um, the thanks for your kind introduction and also to the SCL of India for inviting me to speak here today. I'm delighted to join you and hope next year I can come and join you in person. Sure. So what, what makes an accurate award? I mean, for me, one of the most important things is do not underestimate as an arbitrator how long it will take to write. A, a rushed award is less likely to be accurate. And certainly how I do that, um, and I learned from other very eminent arbitrators, is to write as much of the award in advance of the final hearing as possible. So all of the procedural background also, I find writing the summary of the uh, of the party's written case beforehand that really help. It helps me understand, and it helps me be, I think, more effective at the hearing. But it also means that when I get to writing the substance after the hearing on merits, that I can really focus on the substance itself. So that the time I've booked in my diary for writing up the award, I can focus very much on, on the hearing and what I've heard at the hearing because the other bits I will have already written up in advance. Also, when you ask me what can council do, um, I th I th I'd say three things that council can do to help the award be as accurate as possible. And the first one is this, that, and I still practice as council as well. And I think that as we all know that as council, we want to present are the material that we're relying on in the most positive way for our client's case. And, but there's a line between doing that and actually misrepresenting the material, be it the evidence, be it what you've said previously, what the other side's saying, or, or what a, case, or a law report says, what a decision says. And so for me, what council can do is make sure that they stay firmly on the side of positive pre presentation 
and don't move into misrepresentation because something that makes it very time consuming to write a report is to write up your award is when you have to check every single thing that council has said in writing or orally against the original material because you have noticed or the other side have drawn to your attention that council is misrepresenting, has moved over. And so it means you can't, to make sure that you are accurate, you have to go back to the source material for absolutely everything. Um, so that, that's important. And going with that and a sort of adding to that, and I think it, it stops people misrepresenting, is um, a, a technical issue. And I heard for the honorable minister saying we should be using technology. And of course, now with technology, and especially now so much happens on paperless arbitrations, um, hyperlinking, if as a, you, you give yourself the, um, the rigor as counsel of ensuring you hyperlink all of your written submissions to the source documents, again, it will mean that you check back and you'll say, am I just, am I spinning this in a positive way, which is fine, or have I overstepped the line? It makes it easier for the arbitrator to then follow what you're saying when they're writing their award to check back themselves. But it also, I think, helps moderate council's behavior as well, because it's hard to say this document says black if it clearly says white and you've got a hyperlink to it showing that you can immediately in one click see that it says the opposite of what council has said. And finally, I think having a list of issues, if council can work together and produce a list of issues that the arbitrator will use when preparing their final award, again, that is really helpful and will help the accuracy of the award. But again, I'd say as council that that list has to be reasonable. It helps no one, not least council's own clients, if the list of issues has got four, five, six hundred issues and sub issues on it. A clear sort of short list of issues of maybe 20, 25, 30 issues. And I've been in working as counsel in arbitration when, in arbitrations where we're fighting over billions of dollars in some of the most complex projects that have been built. We can still, if you're sensible, get your list of issues down to a manageable level. And then that means that again, as an arbitrator, you can really focus your attention on the issues that actually matter and that need determining and make ensure that you're extremely accurate on those issues because you're not having to deal with hundreds of sub issues that in reality aren't going to change the overall outcome of the arbitration, but which the council for whatever reason have insisted on getting put onto that list of issues. So those were my, my sort of three things that I thought um, can help with the accuracy of the arbitration award. Then moving to the second point that um, you raised um, in relation to experts, what happens if you don't have experts? Um, and I know the practice in India, you often won't have the delay and disruption experts. Now, part of me, and a slightly flippant answer is, you're quite lucky if you don't have delay and disruption experts, because what so often you will find is that the parties will have spent a huge amount of money producing expert reports in the thousands of pages of vast amounts of detail, and they end up saying the complete opposite to each other. And as an arbitrator, that's not actually remotely helpful. Um, and also what I, I have a personal view that a lot of the people who profess to be experts in delay and disruption are experts in being experts. They're not necessarily actually experts in, for example, in, in, you know, they haven't actually worked as, for example, project managers for 40 years or, or whatever, so that they can actually say, in my experience, too often they're actually saying the computer tells me that this is the answer. So, but ultimately, whether there's an expert or not, causes of delay, causes of disruption are factual. It doesn't matter what the experts say, what they're, they're relying on assumed facts, and it's up to the parties to put forward evidence of the actual facts. And it's up to you as an arbitrator to determine those facts. You have to do that whether there's an expert there or not. And ultimately, actually, you'll find many arbitrators, they'll pay attention to what the experts have said. But ultimately, you'll see a write up of the findings on delay is much more heavily weighted towards the factual evidence than, in fact, what the experts the, the detailed experts report. So it's, it's a topic dear to my heart because I think a lot of time and money is actually wasted 
on delay and disruption experts in construction arbitration. So, in fact, I'm rather fond of the more Indian approach of less expert evidence. I think that could actually be quite helpful in a construction arbitration. Thank you. Oh, Jane, um, you very rightly said experts should be experts. So therefore, if you have an expert who is really an expert, they really simplifies the process. They recreate the entire execution. They make the life of lawyers and arbitrators simpler. However, if you do not have an expert who is not an expert, then it really complicates the life of an arbitrator. I take it, I, I, I can understand this. I sit as arbitrator very often and we have had the same experience what Miller Justice Secret would have had. In fact, in very recent arbitration, big power plant, 600 megawatt and thousands of crores are claims by both sides. There, the London, the arbitral tribunal directed, mandated the, the experts to do the delay analysis by following as planned versus as built method. The claimant side expert professed that he has followed the APAB method. He said that I have referred to SCL protocol. However, I asked one question. How have you analyzed delay impact? He says retrospectively. And this is what SCL protocol says. My next question was, how did you determine critical path under this APAB method? Did you follow contemporaneous method or retrospective method? And what method did you adopt? And he says retrospective method. And that was the funeral of that entire report because a seal protocol also recognizes when it comes to APAB method, critical path determination has to be contemporaneous. And so therefore, either in the enthusiasm to advocate the case of a pointing party or because of unawareness about the methods, whether it is a seal protocol prescribed method or AC, one should be really an expert as you rightly said, Jen, expert has to be an expert. Uh, now, moving on to Julian, who has been listening to us for long now. Julian, after hearing the judge's perspective, arbitrator's perspective, now let us turn the table around and understand from you what you as counsel expect from an arbitrator. Uh, th thank you very much, Ratan, uh, and thanks for the, the, the kind uh, plug for my book, and, and thanks also to Justice Secret for doing so as well. Um, look, from counsel's perspective, I, I don't think there's a huge amount of difference between uh, the perspectives of the arbitrator and of the, the judge in the reviewing court in terms of what we look for in, in an award. Um, where an, an award is required to be reasoned, the main thing is that the award contains sound reasons, so that um, the, the, the party who loses on a particular issue or issues understands why. I think it was Lord, Lord Denning, a, a gentleman who's probably well known in, in most parts of the con con law world, including India. He said the most important person in the courtroom is the person who lost, because they need to understand why, why they lost. So, so an arbitral award should follow that principle and therefore set out what the respective arguments are, uh, it should then engage in a process of reasoning going into the competing arguments, identifying why one argument is preferred over another. And then of course, the conclusion flows from that. And if after that, the, the, the losing party or on the issue or, or the case is able to say, okay, I can see the arbitrator heard my argument. We, we lost on the point, I can understand why. Um, 
then the award has, has, has done its job in that respect. And that's what we're all looking for, whether it's council or I suppose even as a party as well. We'll hear more about that in, in a moment. Um, the other thing I'll mention uh, as well is it's not just about the, the reasons in the award. Timing is absolutely key here as well. And, and I think, as, as Jane was saying, you don't want to have a, an award that's generated too early where not enough time ha has been allowed to consider the issues. But on the other side, um, what is, is not uh, helpful at all is where a, an award is, is issued many months or even years sometimes after the, the hearing on, on the merits. So, so I think timing is absolutely key here. And, and one of the key duties and functions of, of an arbitrator is, is to act in a, in a diligent way. And that, that includes um, not only, of course, setting aside time for the hearing itself, but then post hearing, setting aside time for, for award writing. So there must be that, 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 that time period allowed. And, and that time period can't be months away or even years away. It should be close to when the hearing has taken place. So, so the ideas are still fresh in, in the arbitrator's mind. So those are my thoughts. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jane. And now uh, I move on to Raj B, uh, who is an experienced in-house counsel. So may I request Raj B. Uh, know that you, we have heard perspective of judge, arbitrator, and counsel. Let us understand the consumer's perspective. Rajvir, can you tell us, as in-house counsel, what do you expect from a counsel you engage, the arbitrator, and also the courts acting in support of the arbitration? Over to you, Rajvir. You are muted, Rajbir. You are muted. You are on mute. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Singh, uh, for inviting me to this conference with Justice Sikri, with Honorable Justice Sikri and other esteemed members. Uh, see, in my view, while council briefing is easy, the most important aspect is selection of an arbitrator. And debate always starts, and particularly in the corporates, also debate starts. Why can't we have an expert rather than having a a former judge of a Supreme Court or a High Court, and that debate continues. But I think the view has been, and my view has been, and I'll come to that, I think the it is selection of an arbitrator is the most important and intricate act. The qualification and the arbitral skills of the arbitrator can have considerable impact on the conduct of the arbitration and eventually on the award and its implementation. During the course of the arbitration proceedings, the arbitrator will have the power to determine both substantive and procedural issues in the dispute of the parties. Therefore, the quality of the arbitrator is very, very essential for the success of every arbitration. And I think uh, somebody touched upon the reasoned award, how it has to be done. In my experience, if you take somebody who is only an expert, but he has no legal background, the award will have certain lacunas which is going to be challenged under Section 34 on those grounds. So choosing an arbitrator with legal and professional expertise becomes a paramount thing. Uh, uh, my experience in all these years has been, we have been uh, clear that if, has to, if the matter has to go for an arbitration, the arbitrator must have a legal background and he must be a former judge or a lawyer. And why it is important because the election options means in today's arbitrator uh, world, when we say adjudication of questions of comparative law, conflict of law, statutory interpretation, more often, you know, this is something which can be left to the person who has a legal background and has an experience on the legal issues, how it has to be interpreted and how the limitation and other statutes have to be applied when dealing with the arbitration award. So formal legal education and legal experience will ensure a well-reasoned and legally sound award. And I, I, will, I will say so more from the perspective, I think when we see the arbitrator's role, he has to interpret and apply the rules and laws applicable to the arbitration. He also has to manage the scope of discovery, which is most of the time is undertaken by either of the parties or by both the parties. Conducting the arbitration hearing in which both sides of dispute may submit testimony and therefore conducting the arbitration is not an easy task unless 
a person has been a former judge who knows how to manage both sides it becomes difficult so while while we say that there should be a technical person or person who has an expertise or who is having an engineering background can be an arbitrator but i think we as you know corporates we have been limiting that particular person to call him as an expert witness as and when uh, there is a need or requirement for our arbitrations so uh, i think the making the decision which is resolving the dispute based on testimony evidence and arguments submitted by both sides and then appreciation of that evidence is something which i think only a former judge or a lawyer can do it that's that's my take and uh, 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 we have been speaking to this aspect let's say the preliminary issue sometimes you raise a preliminary issue so at the stage when the arbitration is started you have to have a deal with the preliminary issue if you don't have a judge, former judge or a lawyer it is very very difficult how that preliminary issue will be dealt with whether it has to be seen at the preliminary stage whether it is a limitation or otherwise or it should be left to the stage when the final decision will be taken document production now this is also of particular importance because complex arbitrations which involves claims and counter claims document production becomes essentially important at times when those documents are not there so it's often a challenging and time consuming aspect of any arbitration given the large universe of document that are typically in issue the parties consider how to manage the documentation and only arbitrator can think of how it has to be done during the life of the arbitration and at the final merits lastly record keeping and claim presentation record keeping becomes very very important because chronology of events those are something which have to be kept in mind during the arbitral proceedings and what happened in what sequence uh, you know the parties came and brought those evidence and what arguments were tendered in the facts of each case that becomes very very important at each stage when the final decision is given lastly the claim presentation so there are tables that summarize the position of the parties or the experts on different heads of claims and sometimes it leaves space for the tribunal to record the decision on each issue so unless the arbitrator has a legal background and he has dealt with these issues uh the arbitration uh, finally award which is arbitration award it may suffer from being not a reasoned award that has been my uh, experience so far in last couple of years in arbitration both india as well as international arbitration so uh, the, while while this debate continues we have been keeping the experts as expert witnesses in order to bring certain issues when those documents are required to be proved or expert testimony is required to be tendered but as far as the arbitration uh, you know the arbitrator appointment is concerned we have always been uh, clear whether it is appointed by the parties or it is appointed through the court intervention we have been requesting uh, the honorable courts as well as the other parties let it be an arbitration through the retired former supreme court judges if it is a large uh, amount involved or it's a intricate issue or at the best then the high court former high court judges uh thank you rajbeer uh but difficulty for me now is that you have touched upon most vexed question an ongoing debate for the construction arbitration world which of the two whether the non legal engineers architects or quantity surveyors are best suited as arbitrators for construction arbitration or the lawyers or the judges are better than or appropriately suited for this historically construction industry has preferred to go to arbitration for resolution of their disputes historically the in initial days engineers or the architects or the quantity surveyors used to decide their cases by going to the site visiting the site telling the parties calling the parties and at the site and used to decide then 
God invented lawyers. So came Ancestral Model Law 1996 Act, New York Convention. All of this brought into the element of one aspect that arbitrators should give regions and should follow substantive law. This is where role of lawyers and judges came in as arbitrators. And now we are globally, we are in the regime of, more, we are all modern law countries. So arbitrator is supposed to follow the substantive law to larger extent and are supposed to give regions. So now taking clue from what Rajbir said, I would request my esteemed panelists to give their thoughts on what are the qualifications and attributes which construction arbitrators should possess. May I start with Milord Justice Seekri on that? Yeah, I think uh, we have rightly mentioned that Mr. Rajbir has set the tone uh, while answering the previous question, uh, uh, he has set the tone for this particular question, which you have uh, now uh, asked uh, from that. Uh, he has already mentioned, and in great detail, uh, two things. Number one, that the construction arbitration, arbitrations in general, but more particularly construction arbitrations, uh, involve very complex legal issues. And uh, when we have to give the reasons and legal issues, he has also mentioned at various stages when primary objection, which he said, and which can be reformulated in the sense that when the jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal is challenged, that something is beyond the jurisdiction of the arbitrator uh, or arbitral tribunal, or uh, the proper procedure is not followed, et cetera, these issues are raised. And uh, as I have seen that in most of these uh, uh, contracts, there are, and particularly if these contracts in Indian context and they are with the public sector undertaking or with the government body, uh, two or three types of things which you'll find. Accepted matters, that there are some matters which can't be looked into. It is mentioned in the contract itself. Then exclusionary clauses. Exclusionary clauses is, uh, so as far as accepted matter is concerned, arbitrators have no jurisdiction to look into that matter. Now, exclusionary clauses is that if this, like I gave the example of delay, if delay occurs, the clause would say, the, uh, due to the employer, contractor will get a suitable extension, but no compensation. So this is the exclusionary clause. So therefore, on that basis, it is always argued that, uh, look, you uh, the, the claim for uh, uh, compensation, et cetera, is inadmissible because of this exclusionary clause. And then we have, of course, the issues which are general, whether a particular dispute is arbitrable in general law or not, arbitrability of the disputes. So uh, now all these aspects are purely legal aspects. And as uh, Mr. Rajbi said, that we need legal experts to decide these cases. And uh, even when this question comes of the jurisdiction and uh, the, uh, recent Supreme Court judgment uh, in 2019 uh, of Indians very clearly says, and section 16 application is filed, it is for the arbitral tribunal to decide the application at that stage, or if it can't be decided for some reasons, uh, evidence, et cetera, is required to defer it at a later stage or at the final stage. Now, this expertise at what stage it should be decided and what should be decided, coupled with the fact that when the order is passed, the kind of order, reasoned order, which is to be passed, which should stand the judicial scrutiny, that can be there, uh, I, I mean, uh, uh, the, the, so the, therefore, acumen of uh, 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 an expert who has the uh, legal expertise would be required. At the same time, on the other hand, uh, we know, as uh, I said earlier also, that most of these uh, uh, construction contracts have engineering and other technical aspects, which the civil engineers or uh, other engineers would be knowing better. It, the the, the uh, lawyers, the main reason why these cases 
should go to arbitration and not to uh, should be fought in the court apart from the uh, that uh, time and uh, cost uh, reason for cost effectiveness and uh, it should be decided early another reason is that okay depending upon the nature of the dispute the technical nature the parties would be in a position to uh, select a person as an arbitrator either nominee arbitrator or presiding arbitrator or, or he is going to be sole arbitrator a person who has some expertise in the field so therefore this uh, brings about some kind of uh, dichotomy that on the one hand for such cases we need experts who are technical experts and on the other hand because of the complexities of the cases and which may involve very technical legal issues we need need legal experts also so what i would say that uh, the, the, the uh, if the person yes legal expertise if it is uh, in the sense that uh, a, a, a person who is appointed if it is a sole arbitrator problem may be there if it is a, a tribunal of three members it can be resolved to some extent by nominating uh, a, a, a person who is a, a legal expert and other nominee may, may be a, a, a technical expert and even if the two parties have nominated from one field say both legal experts they can uh, appoint a presiding or chair who is a technical expert or vice versa so that problem can be solved but having said so what i would say that need is there if there is a person who is a legal expert like suppose in the uh, i think we all of us fall in that category we have to have some expertise on the other side and a person who is a, a technical expert or engineer civil engineer etc and therefore uh, then then they should also acquire some legal expertise i have seen from my experience that we should not totally discard those uh, uh, experts in the technical field engineers and others they may be chartered engineers they civil engineers or uh, in any other discipline those who have acquired good expertise there are some of them who have acquired good expertise even in le on legal aspects and they are able to handle legal aspects very well it comes by experience it may be due to training and many may have done uh, law as well i remember a uh, Uh, a, a, a person who was my class fellow in law, uh, he had started doing law after engineering. So well, his father was uh, practicing on uh, arbitration. So he said that you will be a good arbitrator. You do engineering and you do law as well. But then those would be exceptional cases, and therefore some to some extent uh, this this cross discipline uh, has to be learned on both sides. in order to uh, take care of uh, this situation so these are the some of the quali uh, uh, qualification or attributes other thing which i said in the beginning uh, a good arbitrator uh, whether he is a legal expert or he is a technical expert etc uh, when we are talking about time we are talking about cost we are talking about quality in particularly time which mr gadkari if you remember stressed so much in his opening address and how uh delay whether it is at the stage of arbitration deciding the arbitral cases and passing the award or the enforcement of the award in the court at all levels how delay can have so much of cascading effect financial effects etc and therefore uh, the, the how arbitrator should conduct the proceedings particularly from we, we can't uh, discuss that in detail the cmcs etc which uh, but i'm just uh, flagging that issue that uh, uh, also uh, should be a quality of a good arbitrator which the arbitrator should learn uh, that the arbitrator she should be in control of the process from very beginning and what the dispute is should grab and grasp that dispute fully from very beginning by asking the parties and particularly when the pleadings are filed and as i have seen many times the evidence when that is led and most of the time the evidence may relate to documents or the contents of document which is not required so therefore the arbitrator should have skill to control unnecessary uh, uh, cross examination etc which would uh, save time so all these are some of the qualities which the uh, a good arbitrator should possess thank you sir thank you very much and i because of paucity of time now 
I'll, uh, without uh, commenting on what Manuel Justice Eakley has said, uh, I straight away go to uh, Jane to have her thoughts on this, Jane. So I'm going to take a slightly different view from my, my fellow panelists and without wishing to do lawyers out of a job. I think that what's the, the most important characteristics and experience for an arbitrator who's sitting on construction arbitration, you definitely have to have an eye for the detail because there's a lot of documents, there's a lot of detail. You have to have patience as well. Um, but very importantly, you, you need to be decisive. It helps no one if during the many procedural steps, you're always trying to find the middle way. That's, you know, if you, you, it's your role as an arbitrator is to sort of oversee the arbitration, not only to produce that good quality award at the end, but also to ensure the process is expeditious, it's efficient. And sometimes that will require you to make a decision on procedural issues that one party really doesn't like, but you have to have the confidence and the decisiveness to do that. I actually differ a little bit as on, in relation to engineers as arbitrators versus lawyers. I've appeared before and I've sat with some extremely competent engineers who make excellent arbitrators and deal with the legal issues very well. And I think that's particularly true in common law jurisdictions. And I sometimes say this when I'm maybe appearing in front of a dispute board where you often are appearing in front of our engineers and they might be worrying about the law. And I say, this is common law. And the common law essentially started historically as reflecting common sense, you know, the, the practice that, yes, there will be specifics, little quirks, but it's the role of counsel to tell you about those. And so I think that actually a good, well-experienced engineer um, can be a very good arbitrator, in fact. Um, that, and I would agree also with Justice Sigri, I think some of the best arbitrators, and you, we heard from one just now, John Uff, of course, there's Sir Vivian Ramsey, Peter Chapman, there's quite a few, are people who are both engineers and, are, uh, and, and lawyers. They make excellent arbitrators. I mean, I, I'm, an, I'm an accountant and a lawyer, so in cases which have very complicated quantum, you know, I find that I often get appointed on those. So there are actually quite a lot of people who are dual qualified and are active as arbitrators and they can really help or of course in a lot of international arbitration and, and and some domestic arbitration you'll have a panel of three so then you can have a really good mix i appeared recently in front of we had a lawyer an accountant and an economist and they were really good and they paid the most attention i've ever seen to the quantum but we got a really good quality award out of them well initially we were a little bit concerned about the mix for what was a quite a technical construction arbitration so I, th I think that you don't necessarily need lawyers. Uh, I might not be sitting in front of the right group of people to say that, but um, I, th I think that you know, good, experienced, competent engineers or other professionals can be just as good. Uh, I, I, I think, Jane, yeah. uh, you, you didn't say something different from what we said. I think it was <laughs> <laughs> almost the same thing I also said. Yeah, very, well said. <laughs> very well said. Very well said, Justice Seeker. Jen, thank you very much. Jen, thank you very much. Uh, Julian, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I mean, I, I agree with the what I think is the uh, consensus that's developed from, from the panel in relation to the qualities of, of the um, of arbitrators in the construction field, because essentially you want someone who has a dual skill set, someone who knows about whatever the subject matter is, whether it's engineering or architecture or, or quantity surveying, but also someone who, who knows his or her way around the legal side, so the procedure that needs to be followed in, in an arbitration. Uh, and, and this is why you see some of the most successful international arbitrators are people with that dual skill set, uh, as Jay mentioned uh, before. Some, some names like Professor Ruff, who, 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 who we heard from before, um, started life as an engineer, then became a, a barrister. Uh, same with Sir Vivian Ramsey, who, who will be known to everyone uh, listening um, to this, um, this, this session. Uh, so, so look, there are many people who have this, this dual skill set, uh, and, and that's very important. The other thing I'll add is, and this is taking it slightly outside the construction arbitration world, is, is that in those countries which have statutory adjudication of construction disputes, uh, the United Kingdom is, is one such um, uh, country, 
which, which has adjudication, and you find it in Australia and Singapore and other places too. Often the adjudicators are not lawyers. Um, they can be architects, they can be engineers, and a lot of the time, I'd say most of the time, they are producing uh, decisions which are of the same quality as one might find in an arbitration. And, and so we're talking about a, a, a large group of people who are not lawyers, but yet who are deciding uh, important uh, legal issues on, on a daily basis. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So what I understand from the discussion which has, which, which is, and, and in fact, uh, Jen disagreed to agree with me on Justice C3. Julian agreed with both the co-panelists. And I agree with all the three co-panelists. And I would sum up by saying that techno legal are very well suited as appropriate arbitrator, engineers or architects to start with, or quantity surveys to start with, who has also given good amount of time in understanding and learning law. As Julian and Jane both named Sir Vivian Ramsey, John Uff. In fact, 2014, I had occasion to do an ICC arbitration seated in London before Robert Gateskin. Now ICC appointed Robert Gateskin in a dispute where issue was with regard to a defective machine. ICC appointed Dr. Robert Gateskill because he is mechanical engineer by qualification. Turn Queen's concept. So answer is non-legal people should turn themselves with experience and knowledge, academic qualification, turn themselves in techno legal. They are very well suited. Similarly, legal people should turn themselves as technical people as well by learning the language of engineers, by understanding and speaking the language of engineers, by knowing the typical disputes in construction industry, by knowing the typical answers and solutions to them, and by high, high, having eye for the details and neck for learning. So best suited arbitrators are techno-legal, legal-technical. These are the best answers that emerges from this conversation. One last question, because we are running a lot of uh, sort of time. And since it was this debate, was was out of turn, I would say, because it was initiated by Rajbir. It was such a fantastic uh, 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 ignition given by uh, uh, Rajbir. So we started with this. Uh, one question, which which is very important question, which occurs in mind of many, many arbitration professionals is management of records in construction arbitration. If I can request Jane to give a few words on that in brief, and then we move on to the last topic and we conclude the session. Thank you, Ratan. And I think this um, the management of documentation is becoming even more an important issue now as we're increasingly moving on to paperless arbitrations. Because on the one hand, that's great. In the old days, I was always surrounded by hundreds of boxes of documents. Now I just have um, sort of a, an extra removable hard drive to cover all the material. But people mustn't use that as an excuse to simply dump thousands and hundreds of thousands of documents on the arbitrators. That doesn't help the arbitrators. It largely increases the cost. It makes it longer for the awards to come out. There has to be some rigor as to what material gets put before the arbitrators and how. Now, something that I like doing both as counsel and as arbitrator, though I would say I've only been able to get people to agree to this a few times. It was actually on a very large um, Indian arbitration where my opposing, opposing counsel agreed and it worked very efficiently, um, was to have two sets of core material at the very beginning or very early on. Because if you've got a dispute which is concerning delay and disruption on a large construction project, the reality is that experienced counsel and experienced arbitrators know 
what documents are ultimately going to be in front of the tribunal. And so sort of trying to eke them out, maybe one party reject, you know, resisting document production and things until to try to make sure that those documents only get produced at the last minute or whatever isn't particularly helpful. So what I try to encourage the parties to do or my opponents to do is say up front, let's agree a core bundle that we will use and we will number and we will reference from the very beginning. It will have the progress reports, the payment applications, the payment certificates. One might have the drawings, the sort of requests for inspections or you know, the non-conformance reports, all those sort of standard documents that you know there's a fair chance a lot of those will be referred to. Putting those all into a core electronic bundle up front. Also, in parallel, what I try to do is either agree or direct that the experts have a common bundle of documents from the beginning. And so that every time the lawyers make some documents available to the independent experts, they have to upload them onto this database where the other side's counsel and lawyers will also be able to see it. Because again, you'll often see that lawyers sort of dump huge amounts of material onto the expert. The expert then rifles through, decides what they think is relevant, but they've actually seen a much broader range of documents. And so that ensures there's complete parity from the beginning and throughout. The experts have the same documents at the same time. I think that also controls the amount of information people give their experts because they think a little bit more about it if they know that it's immediately going to be seen by the other side's experts and lawyers. But also it means then you'd need virtually no document production because if you've got all these documents in these common bundles up front, there's very little left to ask for document production. And then often if you've actually got your experts and the parties both having access to the same documents from an early stage, you'll find that the experts' opinions won't be that far apart. And you might well end up with an earlier settlement because if the experts aren't that far apart, there's less incentive to the parties to you know, fight all the way through. So I'd say that's how I try to manage it. Um, at the moment, it sometimes takes some persuading of my opponents or the parties as well, because it does. it's quite a change from the mindset of I'm going to keep everything as close to my chest as possible and only let the other side see the minimum. But personally, I think you know, your clients have agreed to go to arbitration. It's meant to be, to some extent, collaborative. We should have this way of working, and especially as projects nowadays tend to have these projects overriding um, document databases anyway. You can actually use those existing project document management systems for the arbitration rather than trying to create something entirely new and, and discrete separately. So I think that's what I try to do. Actually, both as counsel and arbitrator, I think it works both ways. Thank you very much, Jane. And the last, uh, last topic for uh, all my uh, for answer of, of from all my parents. In pursuit of our unified goal, my final question goes to all our panelists. And rather, I also invite all the attendees watching to ponder over it as well for the next few days of the conference as well. If you had to say one practice that construction arbitration could improve on, what would you say it was? So let us hear from Miller Justice Seekri, followed by Jane, Julian, and Raj B. In fact, we will welcome thoughts on this. One thing which you want to be changed for construction arbitration, I urge all the attendees to say their, say their one thoughts on this because the Honorable Minister has asked me to send the recommendation of the conference so it will be taken, it will be, it will be sent to him as well. One of the recommendations of this, this, this conference, go, which is surely going to the, to, the, to the minister, is what Justice Seekley talked about in a couple of minutes back, where he says there are cases where you have clauses, no claim for delay clauses. Now, no claim for delay clauses is not typical to India. No claim for delay clauses are the clauses which says that also, a delay, employer may have caused, contractor doesn't get compensated for that. It is not peculiar to India. It is, it is all across the globe. 
In fact, the Australian court, where Julian's book refers, says in one of the matters, they say for variation, it doesn't apply. But typically, these kind of clauses are enforceable clauses all across the globe. But this is something I would say it is all about uneven risk allocation. And I'm going to make a request to the minister who had said that in, in my conversation with him, if law needs to be brought in, if law needs to be changed, give us your suggestions, we'll work on this. So now with this one thought in very brief, may I start with Milo Justice C for his kind uh, words. Uh, thank you, Ratan. Since you are asking only for one thought, uh, there may be so many, but uh, one thing which I would say is that the process of mediation should be very well ingrained into the arbitration system or uh, the, whether it is uh, MEDA or ARMED or MEDA, MED, etc., whatever, in whatever form, but it should become most effective tool. And in this process only, when we talk of, we have in our various contracts, I find, uh, this uh, dispute boards, etc., in the uh, uh, resolution clause itself in the agreement provides that before going for arbitration, there would be in-house dispute uh, boards, which may consist of uh, uh, either some high officers or maybe representative on both sides. And of course, it is normally said that the recommendation would not be binding, but they will try to arrive at uh, the settlement, etc. So here I would like that uh, I have seen from my experience, even if when some of the issues are sorted out by uh, such board members or boards, that if it is in favor of the contractor, employer or the government particularly when they, they, they don't agree. If it is in favor of the, uh, uh, something is in favor of the employer, the contractor will not agree. And therefore ultimately everything lands up in the court or uh, before the arbitration. So what is the use of that? So therefore that some sanctity should be uh, attached uh, to these uh, uh, dispute boards who are there and once they decide something and which Mr. Gadgari also said that the conciliation committees in NHAI they have formed that it would be decided within two months or three months. It may be conciliation, it is mediation or an adjudication rather we may call it a neutral evaluation by the board. That should be given due respect. If that is given at the appropriate level, much of the disputes would get resolved there and would not even come for arbitration. So if you ask me for one, this is what I feel that. Thank you. Thank you, Milo, just to see me. Uh, Jane. Thank you. I would say to encourage arbitrators, the parties and their lawyers to work together collaboratively. Your clients have agreed not to litigate and to go to arbitration, which gives you a vast range of flexible options as to how you want the arbitration to proceed so that you can get a quick, and relatively inexpensive decision out the way for your clients so they can put the arbitration behind them and get on with their commercial work. Um, it might seem that you're, you're, but some people sometimes think it's weak if you collaborate, if you make concessions on procedure and things. But in fact, if you can get the arbitration out of the way and your client can continue with their commercial business, you're doing your client a great service and it's much better than fighting for the, over the tiny issues, you know, for years and years and years. Uh, Jane, uh, you have said something which compels me to tell you that in the next biannual conference, in the first opening session, we are going to have you once again to speak on what you just said, and that is mandate for arbitration does not amount to mandate to go to litigation. Rather, it is a mandate to not litigate. What does it mean for arbitration community? That is an interesting point of debate, can be an interesting point of debate, but we do not have time. We'll reserve it for next biannual conference with you as one of the speakers. Now, going back to uh, 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 Jane on the, the, the Julian on this. Thanks very much, Rattan. I mean, I think echoing what uh, Jane was alluding to, I'd say what we can improve on is, is cost and time. Construction arbitration costs a lot of money. It can take a lot of time. So what can we do? I don't think anyone's 
come up with a, a universal solution. But I'll share um, my one and only slide, if, if, if that's okay, which uh, covers this, this, this issue. Can you see that? Do you have that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I can, good. I can hear you. Can, can you see my slide? No. Okay, let, let me try again. Um, sorry. Um, there. Okay, right. So, so my, my law firm, White and Case, does a yeah, survey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can every, see that. Great. Every two years with Queen Mary uh, University in London. And uh, users of arbitration get asked lots of questions about what can be improved upon. And I found this in, in the latest survey from 2021. Uh, and so the question is, if you were a party or counsel, which of the following procedural options would you be willing to do without if this would make your arbitration cheaper or faster? And you can see right at the top, that the thing that seems to have struck a nerve is uh, this one, unlimited length of written submissions. So, so users of arbitration are clearly saying here, if you have, uh, if you have no page limits on, on your submissions, uh, on, on your pleadings and so forth, then that is something that can drive up costs. So it, it seems to me, if we're looking for um, short-term gains that can be made uh, to, to improve upon the cost of arbitration, that's one thing that can be done. Use page limits. Thank you very much, Jen, for being brief and sharing your amazing slide, which I'm in awe of. Now, my last co-panelist, last panelist, Rajbi. One thought, very brief. So I completely agree with Honorable Justice Sikri. I think this process of mediation should be there and it should not be a mechanical exercise. What happens at times, it is referred to the mediation, but that is not being taken as a serious thing. So there should be some seriousness to resolve the dispute, which I think will avoid unnecessary litigation and arbitration, which continues then thereafter. So, uh, I think uh, the, the attempt should be that at the mediation level, parties should settle. And after the mediation, the matter should be resolved. That is only I can, I can say. Great. In fact, for construction, for mediating construction dispute, my sense is we need to have trained construction mediators who know the industry who know typical disputes and who also know typical answers and have neck for details and knows the tools of mediation. So very well said, Rajbi. So with this, and since I am moderating the session, let me also give one thought of mine on this. And my thought is, particularly for Indian arbitration, for Indian arbitrators, on the very first day of arbitration hearing, first day. I'm not talking about trial, hearing in that sense. Very first day when parties and arbitrator meet, let arbitrators, honorable arbitrators, <laughs> direct the parties and councils to say their case, give the opening statement in half an hour or 45 minutes each. It makes the whole process easier. It makes the case management easier. It makes the decision on discovery application easier. It makes to appreciate what is relevant, what is not relevant in cross-examination easier. With this, I am really glad and honored to have such a such a eminent panel with me. I must thank Melo Justice Sikri for taking our time from his busy schedule. He's really a big, the, be one of the busiest arbitrators we have in India. Thank you, thank you so very much for being with us. Jane, you are equally the very busy arbitrator. We, you are, we, we are really grateful and thankful to you. Same goes to Julian. We all know Julian and we all are a fan of Julian. As just a secret said, I also have your, this latest edition as my, on my bedside table, which I have my fight with my wife very often. Uh, and Mr. Sachdeva, Rajbir, a good friend of all of us, has really set the tone for this interesting debate on who are best qualified, better suited to be an arbitrator. With this, I close this session, which is a very interesting session, which I'm sure sets the tone for the next two days. 
Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, once again for this. Thank you. Thank you very much.